Hello, Riverside. My name is Steve Pruitt. It is good to be with you today. I'm excited to open our Bibles and talk a little bit in 1 Peter about love. We know there's a lot going on in the culture and it will speak directly to some of what we're dealing with, whether you're here in Fort Myers or wherever you find yourself. And after we pray, I've got a little special guest, so let's pray and I'll introduce him. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for meeting us where we are. Thank you for the way you so consistently prove that it is living and active and that you use it in our lives uh, on a daily basis. And God, we know there's a lot of things going on in our culture right now. There's elections coming up and that creates tensions and uncertainty. And we just ask that you give us wisdom that you put the things on our hearts and our minds that we need to make good decisions, that you, you guide us in that and you help us in the midst of it, Lord, to love each other well, to love our neighbors well. And I thank you that you'll use your word today to wrestle through some of what that might look like. So we ask, Father, that your spirit work among us. Use your word to change us. We thank you for Jesus who saved us in his name. Amen. Okay, I got a special guest. Let's hear it for the love doctor. I <laughs> love it. That's me, baby. It's the love doctor. I am on fire. <laughs> this thing on. This thing on. Maybe you recognize me. Or you've heard me whisper sweet love nothings in your ear. <laughs> All right, you cool cats and kittens. I got five tips for love, five success tips for getting the love, giving the love you need. We got to do them quick, babies. We may not have much time. Here we go. Number one, take everything personally. Be offended. Read into it. Find ways to be offended. Everybody is out to get you. <laughs> Number two, assume the worst. Make the worst assumption. Whatever that thing is you fear he might have meant or she thought about saying. She did, baby. She did. Assume, assume, assume it, baby. <laughs> Number three, assert my rights. I mean, assert your rights. <laughs> it's all about you, baby. <laughs> As if. <laughs> Number four, get all you can. This is all there is, baby. This is the big show. Get all you can. Why worry about the afterlife? I'm sure it will be great. <laughs> Number five, repost everything. This is the key to my strategy. I mean, the key to love. <laughs> repost it, baby. Don't think about it. Don't think twice. Don't look it up. Just click, baby. Click. And finally, when you're done, Drink it off, baby. Drink it off. It'll all come out in the fire. <laughs> uh oh, here he comes. <laughs> oh, I'm really sorry about that. Um, I was watching from over there. I kept thinking it would get better. I thought he was going somewhere useful. What a train wreck. I took a risk on that guy. It said he was the love doctor. You know, we pray for protection. But now and then, the devil gets through our defenses, doesn't he? He gets in our heads. It's easy to see his advice playing out all around us. There's an election next week. How much of a modern political campaign is summed up in these ideas? Where anything said by the opposition, you just take it and assume and magnify it. But it hardly stops in politics, right? Do you use Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or Twitter? This is the culture we live in. It, maybe it's the culture we've always lived in. Open your Bible to 1 Peter so you can turn that thing on, get it out of your pocket, or go grab it off the shelf, or go find one this week. And we're going to be in the first chapter, starting at verse 22, and we'll go into the beginning of the second chapter. I think that'll make sense once we do it. You can go all the way to the end of your Bible and start working your way back to find this. Uh, Peter's going to give us some advice on love, some real advice, and it's actually going to seem to go directly against everything the devil just said. The culture we live in, the culture always has cried out for love, but doesn't always know, rarely knows how to get there. 
So the Bible teaches us how do you love. And it will warn us against love advice from the devil. There will be five really specific things here in 1 Peter. So let's read the first part. We need to see why love matters before we see how to do it. Ready? Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Before he tells us how to do it, he explains who you are, who we are. Again, if you need a place in your Bible to figure out who you are, the book of 1 Peter is the place. So far, just in these first 22 verses, so far he told us we're elect exiles. We've been chosen by the Father through the holy making of the Spirit for the Son. We've been born again to a living hope. You're heirs of an imperishable undefiled, unfading inheritance. You're guarded by God for salvation. You are obedient children of God and you've been ransomed. That's pretty good. We may have even skipped some stuff in those first so many verses. But now he says you've purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. Do you remember purifying your souls? The, the word here purified, it's hognizo. It, it's related to this other word back in Verse 2, hagiadzo, for sanctification, holy making. This is where we're told the Holy Spirit is doing that work, and he's doing it for obedience to Jesus Christ, which seems to be the idea that Peter is building on down here in verse 22. This word purified is related to the sanctification from up there, the process of being made holy, of being set apart. It has ritual implications, like in worship, uh, it's used in the book of John and in the book of Acts in your Bible to refer to purifying or preparing or setting yourself aside for worship with a ritual of some kind of cleansing. So, having set yourselves apart by obedience to the truth, you're set apart to be who you are, submitting to your identity. Submitting to your identity who you are now, obedient to Christ that prepares you to be used. For example, being a Christian, I like to think of it as like being like a bird. You can walk on your own two legs, but you have wings now. You were made to fly. You're being called to step into it. Specifically, you were made for a sincere brotherly love. Love's not just a thing you do. It's a thing you are for. Not just any love, but a sincere uh, unhypocritical. This is on hypocritos. You hear hypocrite in there? It's where we get the word and you stick the ah in front of it and it makes it the negative. It's unhypocritical brotherly love. And that's the word Philadelphia, brotherly love. You set yourselves apart in obedience for unhypocritical love. That's actually probably Philos, not Philadelphia. That, you'd have to have city in there. Anyway, you get the idea. Part of being a Christian, part of being made for obedience to Jesus is unhypocritical brotherly love. So if that's true, it's what we're for. It's easy to get confused here. You look at this election and you, you, do you vote what's best for you or do you vote what's best for your brothers and sisters? makes it much more complicated, right? It, but not really. It kind of simplifies things. We put others first. Unhypocritical love. What is unhypocritical love? And why do we need to be told that? I, I think it's easier if you, you consider the opposite. What is hypocritical love? This guy could help us with that. We don't need him. Hypocritical love is when you love someone while they're in the room. When they're out of sight, they're out of mind. Or when you've got friends that embarrass you when you're around other friends, you're embarrassed by them. Or embarrassed if people see you 
with them. Why is that? Are they your friends or not your friends? Because if they're only your friends when nobody else is available, or only when they're in the room, or only if no one sees, that is hypocritical love. It sets conditions that you can't meet or they can't meet. It's love with strings attached to it. And love with strings attached isn't love. You are for unhypocritical, sincere, real love. It's what you're for. It's what you've been sanctified for, what you've set yourself apart for. Now, here's the command. Here's the what you are to do. You are to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. This is that word agape that we love to talk about. Agape one another. It's an unconditional love. It's the kind of love where I've made a decision to love. And he tells us to do so earnestly or deeply. The New Bible commentary says with every muscle strained. It's like all the way from a pure heart. The word for pure is the word we get cathartic from. And the idea of this word is that it's cleansed or been purged, a heart that has been cleaned. How does a heart get uncleaned? How does it start the other way? Well, try that. You, you love your wife clean until she cheats on you. But then you reconcile, but do you trust her? Well, maybe eventually. Or you love your friend clean, but you remember when he hurt you that time. Or you remember that one time she let you down and you're still a little bit sore and you're hanging on to part of that in the love. It's got dirt in it. I had a homeless friend years ago who resisted love. She had learned to use people and to trust no one. And there was a team that formed around her who were predetermined to love her cleanly. Decision had already been made. We will see through her defensiveness and not be triggered or irritated by it. We're not going to come in with anger. We understand her woundedness. We recognize that her aggression is just from those wounds. And her own life, I'm not going to take them personally. It's loving clean from a pure heart. You're determining to love without strings. Trust is earned, but love can be clean without condition, a decision, not just a feeling. Verse 23, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. That's an earthy image. Peter here is using a term that's anatomical and agricultural, seed or spora. It's from the same word group as sperma. Uh, the agriculture provides the anatomical image. You'd plant a baby, at least the metaphor, you plant a baby like you were planting grain. Peter, in a moment, will compare you to grass or wheat. But back in the first chapter, you were a child with a new Father, you've been born again by his seed or spora, the seed of God, the living word of God. That caused you to be born again, and that is eternal. Therefore, because you've been born of eternal seed, you are eternal. And then Peter quotes James, who's quoting Isaiah, to remind us, for all flesh is like grass and all its glory, like the flower of grass, the grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. The word, the seed that caused you to be born again is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And James says the word was implanted in you. Peter's building on that idea that James was using. It's been implanted because you've been reborn to eternity by the eternal seed of God implanted in you through the Word of God, and you will live forever along with the Word of God, you now, with the DNA of God through this perfect seed, you're no longer bound by the DNA of your corrupted flesh. You, you have wings. You're new. It's different. So love one another earnestly from a pure heart, love to the point of strain. But how do you do that? He explained you're not what you were, that you're no longer of the perishable seed of the flesh, but now eternal seed of God. Word 
implanted in you the living word Jesus is in you. But how do you love that way? Well, the one who now lives in you is able to do what you and your flesh could not do. You now have the ability to love by Him loving through you. How do you do it? How do you love? Glad you asked. That's so where we move into chapter 2, verse 1. So, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. This is what the love doctor gets completely wrong. Matter of fact, his advice was the exact opposite. He said, take everything personally, which is what we do in our flesh when it's just us. This is what we did back with the perishable seed, you before Jesus. In the old uh, New International Version, not the new one, the old one, it would call the flesh the sin nature. That's the wrong idea. They've changed that sense. You, you don't have a sin nature. You just have humanness, your flesh, you without Jesus. I have a friend who used to joke about taking everything personally. He would say, sometimes in the morning, he'd just say, hey man, I want you to know I decided today I'm going to take everything personally. I'm just going to see how it goes for me today. Have you ever done that? You get up in the morning, you walk in the bathroom, the toothpaste is left open, and you think, why does she hate me? Or he must resent me. And then you think, I'll get her, I'll leave the seat up. Or I'll get him, that sour milk in his coffee should be fun. <laughs> Oops. Or you're doing okay, and then you go online and you see some post from a friend, and you think, they know I hate that. I know they're doing that on purpose. Or you get to school, the professor makes a comment, you think, he's out to get me. Or somebody is parked in your space at work, and you think, what a selfish jerk. It can't be because they were running late and it was the only open space. It's, no, they, they know better. They hate me. Somebody eats your lunch, and you think, it's because they want me to quit. <laughs> you take it personally. It's a great way to fill your heart with malice. The word malice is uh, in Greek, it's kakias. It, isn't that crazy? Kakaias refers to wickedness or depravity or evil. It's used in the book of Titus to describe how we once spent our days in kaka, in kakias. Have you ever spent a day in malice, tossing around ways you could get even? dreaming about him going bald, or Botox poisoning, or getting COVID, or Kian, her car, or his car. When you're born again, you're called to put that aside. It's not who you are anymore. That's a lust of your former ignorance. Don't conform to it. You no longer live in accord with the flesh. You've been born of imperishable seed. You're made of eternal stuff being made holy by the Holy Spirit. You don't walk by flesh, but by the Spirit. And the Spirit says, instead of taking it personally, put away all malice. No revenge, no plotting, no simmering. You love clean. You don't hold their ignorance against other people. Most of the time, people never knew they hurt you. Even when you get an angry email, it's usually just because somebody wants you to consider their view or they wrote it without realizing that you would read it the way you read it. It's usually unintended. Second thing people do, assume the worst. That is a fast track to misery. And it seems to be the code of the internet. Oh, you did that because you're a conceited bigot who hates women. Whoa, you know, it doesn't even have to be the, the worst. You can just assume, and usually that by itself makes things go badly. You just start assuming people's motives, and that will be a mess. I'm going to tell a story about my wife, and I hope that as we go through this, she's committed to loving me to the point of straining, because I didn't ask her if I could share this. Um, she had a long day on Tuesday, and she texted me, Will you get dinner? I didn't see that text. I got home about 6.30 and she was gone. And I asked around, she had gone to get dinner. She got home with food and she seemed a little irritated. And I said, what's up? And she said, I'm just tired, I'm hungry. I didn't sleep well because that smoke alarm went off at 1.30, which really did happen, nobody slept well. Um, 15 minutes passed of tension. And then she grabbed her phone, something happened on it. She picked up her phone and she started laughing. Well, it turns out she didn't text me about dinner. She texted one of her friends, another teacher, can you bring dinner? And do you have any dominoes for class? <laughs> she had been frustrated because not only did I not bring dinner, I didn't even respond to her text. But then she found out she had never texted me. 
We tend to assume. And sometimes we assume the worst. And we think, my motives are always good. Your motives are always bad. The Bible tells us, put away all deceit. That's not saying the opposite is not lying. The, the word deceit there means more than just being deceitful. It's a craftiness. Um, it, it actually means crafty or stealthy or cunning. It's where you use other methods to try to make things happen. This is you taking your cleverness and using it to get your way. If malice is a direct assault against a person, this is the sneak attack. It's the way you catch a fish. This word can be used in that context. You bait it. It's insincere love, meaning there are false motives or there are simmering resentments. It is passive aggressive. It's fake politeness where you're just waiting on your friend to figure out what she did wrong or that you didn't bring dinner or you're waiting on him to read your mind, assuming. Or it's the condescending email where you, you, you've never done this. But Steve, I'm sure you don't know this, but the people I talk to all agree that you're doing this wrong. It's the, honey, I know you don't have a degree in this and I know you've got a degree in art uh, so maybe you should let us work on this problem. Do you see that? Sometimes it's so second nature, we don't even realize we do it. You front load the communication with an accusation or an assertion of your intelligence or this invisible army of people who are on your side or you start with an intimidating set of big words or a demoralizing pre-attack in order to get your way. Don't. Third one, assert your rights. This is what I need from you. I can't be friends with anyone who disagrees with me. No one will tell me what to do. This is America. Be careful. At the risk of taking things personally, this whole mask thing has been a trip, right? Never saw it coming. No seminary classes on this one. My pastor friends around the country are stressing out over it. Nobody prepared for this. You can weigh the data, you talk to experts, talk to your friends. We make the best decisions we can. We may be wrong. I may be wrong. But remember this, Christian. We lay down rights, not demand them. Jesus said, if you want to lead, serve. So when you walk into the shoe store and a 16-year-old asks you to put on a mask, we preempt that puppy. Before you walk in the store, read the sign on the door. That 16 your old kid is in that moisture bubble all day long and maybe going home to a vulnerable grandmother. You don't know. But when this thing is over, how do we want to be known? I hope that when it's all done, the world will view the Christians as the least selfish people. The Christians as the ones who are quickest to surrender their rights for others, the quickest to serve other people. This passage is about love. If you want to love your wife, your husband, your friend, your kid, and they know you as the one who asserts rights and says things like wash my dishes, fold my clothes, put gas in my car, meet my needs, and they also know you as the one who says, I worship Jesus, I love him, I'm the best at humility. <laughs> they may consider that a bit twisted. Peter says, put away hypocrisy, that brotherly love of verse 22 that has to be sincere, has to be true, not twisted. It needs to be honest. You deal with the real motive, not the false humility we use to hide them. Oh, I just wanted what was best for you. Mm -hmm. First time I experienced that, somebody just laying the real motive out there without any twist or slant on it. Uh, a friend had told me a secret about Haley. Haley was expecting a baby, but nobody was supposed to know. But now I knew, and when I saw Haley, I hinted that I knew. And my friend came back at me really angry. He's like, why did I tell? You knew nobody's supposed to know. And I thought, well, I was just happy. And he said to me, no, you had a secret. You felt left out, and you wanted to feel important and included. And I said, no, maybe, yes. I was awful. My motives were just right there on the table. But it was kind of freeing, too, to go, I really did do it for that reason. You know what? I can actually tell the truth about my motive and own it. It's different when you say to somebody, I don't like wearing this mask. Are there any options for me? 
rather than, how dare you ask this of people? You, you with me? I'm learning to do this when I negotiate too. When I get the, hey, that's $430, $435 for that repair. Sometimes I say, is there any way you could make it 400 even? Instead of trying to twist and argue or being tempted to say, because my mama is sick. But just sticking with the truth and saying, you know, it would help me out if you could make it 400 even. You just tell the truth. Just put it out there. This summer, we rented an RV to go to Tennessee because we needed, this was early in the pandemic, March, April, and we needed to, to be, we wanted to be with our families, but have a way to have distance. Uh, part of our family is at very high risk. And so we got on the road and realized there was something wrong with the way our vehicle was carrying the weight of that thing. We changed several things. We couldn't get it to ride correctly, so it wasn't safe. We turned around, we called the RV place. Like, can we get a smaller one? And he said, I don't know. Well, I started pushing on it and then I, they rushed it and got it done for me. But that afternoon we found out we had actually been exposed to the virus then and we needed to stay home. So we returned the RV and they charged me full price. He gave me a voucher, but no refund. I was angry. That felt very unfair, but it was in the paperwork. I asked for a refund. I got a no. I sat on this for several weeks. One morning, I decided I'm going to see this guy. I'm angry, I'm entitled, I have rights. And I was thinking through malice. Could I leave a bad review or I'd spread the word about them or even better, I'll get a lawyer friend to write a letter. And when I realized what was going on in my head, I pulled over in a parking lot and I sat there a minute and I just prayed about whether I should go see him. And I said, okay, God, the truth is, I feel like I was cowardly and how I asked for my money back. And I just did it by email and I didn't even face to face. So really this is just about my ego and my pride and we could use the money back. There's a contract, but it feels unfair to not refund part. And so I said, okay, God, what do I do? And a little voice says, well, what does he need? I'm like, huh? What's who need? Didn't you hear me? He's, well, what's the guy need? What's the owner need? The, oh, he needs to see Jesus. So I started the car. I drove across the road to their office. I walked in, he recognized me. And I said, hey, I understand the deposit and I wish we could get some of the rest back, but since not, could I transfer that voucher so one of my friends could maybe use it? It caught him completely off guard. He thought about it and he agreed. Yeah, that was something he could do. So if you need a voucher for, for a camper rental, come see me. But then I left. I have no idea what the long-term impact is of that or if there's any, but I had peace because first I stopped and asked God first. And that guy may connect me to Riverside one day and I represent what we think of Jesus. And that was more important, right? Sincere unhypocritical love. So fourth one, bad advice is get all you can. Do we need to talk about this? This is behind so many things in our lives, our culture. It's behind the pornification of culture where sex becomes about pleasure for you, not about love for her or him. It's behind the materialism, the greed, behind that fear that leads to bunkers. There won't be enough, so I need to hoard, so I have plenty and others don't. I struggle with this one. If I'm honest, I struggle with it when it comes to tools out in my workshop. Not just that there are better tools, but that I need more. I'm not even doing woodworking professionally, but I'm always looking for bargains online. The opposite, what the Bible tells us, is to put away envy. We do great with envy until we wake up in the morning, or maybe that's just me. I'm doing great with it while I'm asleep, and then I wake up and I'll see my neighbor or classmate or coworker. Or you look online, you see somebody else's remodeling project or the trip they're on or their car or their loving spouse or their food or their kids or their friends. There's no end to the things that can make us insecure and jealous. So we spend money or we do things. We force our friends into experiences or we post photos and compare people that we love to other people and we let them know that they don't measure up. Our friends don't look like their friends. We need you to do what, is that what we want? Is that what we really believe? I don't think it is, right? 
We want the sincere love thing. So he tells us to put away envy. Fifth one, repost everything. And then when others post it and you repost it, you can just say, hey, you never know. <laughs> I'm not saying that's true, but it has a right to be heard. No, not everything needs to be heard or shared. Some things are false or slanderous. Uh, there's a word here, slander, kata lalia. It's the idea of speaking against. Lalia is speaking and kata is uh, against. It's a, a um, what do you call them things? Preposition. You, you don't have to be right um, in order to be wrong. You can slander someone without knowing. Uh, you can do it when you repeat something that you do not know to be true or something that is not yours to repeat. You put it all away. Don't pass on things that inflame rather than inform. Don't inform if it's gossip, if it's slander, if it's malicious. Put away all slander like newborn infants. Long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Have you tasted that the Lord is good? He, the image there is of a baby rooting for a breast, this earthy stuff. You got the seed of the father and now his milk. Early Christian art uh, understood this. You find some that actually shows God with breasts, some early church fathers, those babes that seek the word, the father's breasts of love. His imagery was earthy. And Peter assumes that you have tasted God's goodness. This is another of those first class conditions. The syntax is arranged so the assumption is that it's true. If indeed, or you could translate it since, or because you have tasted it, you should long for it. Because you know how good it is. And it is pure. It's pure. It's unadulterated. There's nothing in it. There's nothing wrong with it. This word dalos earlier in the passage was used for deceit. And we said that it involves stealth and cunning and sneakiness. If you put the A on the front of that, the alpha, it makes it the opposite. It makes it the negative now. So the spiritual milk of God has no deceit, no sneakiness, no ulterior motives. It's pure, unadulterated. He conceived you. He sustains you. Professor Karen Jobes, in her commentary on First Peter, I emailed her years ago and she validated those things. That's not just me being shocking. She said, when Peter exhorts them to crave spiritual milk, he's not telling them to crave the Word of God as if commanding them to listen to more sermons or to read more scripture as good and even necessary as those activities may be. He is saying that God in Christ alone both conceives and sustains the life of the new birth. They are to crave the Lord God for spiritual nourishment. The devil love doctor might tell you to get all you can and then drink off the consequences. The Lord would tell you pure spiritual milk. The Lord would tell you, long for me, long for him. He is the pure spiritual milk you need. He is how you love because you have experienced him. So how do you love? Well, I skipped something. This put away, it's not actually a command. It's a participle. It's a supporting verb. The command was love one another earnestly from a pure heart, or to love to the point of strain. You strain all your muscles in loving. That was the command. And that command was supported by three participle clauses, three supporting clauses. The first was having purified your souls by obedience to the truth. And then after it came having been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. And now putting away malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. And then there's a second command after that. Having done those things, love earnestly and long for the pure spiritual milk. Crave it like a newborn baby rooting at its mother's breast. So how do you love? You crave Him so you can grow up 
into your salvation, into your purpose for obedience to Jesus, for sincere brotherly love. Is that where you are? Is your heart full because he's sustaining it and you're overflowing with that? Or has your heart become cold, bitter, hard? Because the cure is our spiritual milk. You don't fix this by working harder. You fix it by drawing near to him, longing for him, stepping into him, letting him love through you. Will you pray with me? Father, it's good to be reminded that you are the source of our life and the sustainer. And when we're struggling to do the things that we believe you've called us to do, what we actually need is more time with you. Just to step into who you are, to walk back through what Peter has told us about you and about what that makes us in Christ. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to, to refresh the longing for you for those of us who have tasted your goodness, Lord. Let that be an insatiable desire that we might continue seeking more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. I will see you soon.